It's the cultural stigma that puts people in denial. But are we missing a vital point here? Our presuppositions about what causes um, HIV in Africa um, have a lot to do with our own cultural biases. One of those is that we like to focus uh, very heavily on the idea of individual responsibility. When we see somebody uh, suffering from a disease, uh, especially a sexually transmitted disease, we like to think that it's somehow their fault. Um, and this is why the anti-AIDS campaign is focused so much on behavior change. The problem with this is that it prevents us from seeing the broader structural factors that, uh, that drive behavior, that constrain behavior, that force people to make certain kinds of decisions that are kind of beyond their control. These broader structural factors, so runs the argument, are economic. They have to do with measures imposed on Africa by Western institutions, such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Trade Organization. The question here becomes, uh, whose behavior is pathological? The, the behavior of poor people who've contracted HIV or the behavior of the rich people in the West who control the economy? And the key issue here is not race, but class. It's a question of poverty that is the main driver of HIV transmission. Dr. Hickel was born and raised in Swaziland. His research points not only to poverty as the main driver of HIV AIDS in Southern Africa, it's a particular kind of poverty that comes through worker migration. In Southern Africa, there's a very dense and vast network of rotating labor migration. Sometimes they're away from home for as long as 11 months at a time and back at home for only about one month. Okay, uh, and people travel sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles to get to their, to their workplace destinations. So it's a history of, of taking away Africans' land and, and undermining their ability to subsist on their own. That was the initial driver of this rotating labor migration system, and it's still in place today. It's this migration system, argues Hickel, that has driven the spread of AIDS. When the virus uh, was first introduced to the continent in the early 1980s, then it spread really rapidly along these labor migration routes. So in some senses, it was sort of an epidemic waiting to happen. There's nowhere else in the world that we see such entrenched labor migration routes, and so it's not surprising that the spread was not nearly as quick in other places. The reason for these high rates of HIV transmission, argues Hickel, has to do with working conditions. The people that, from Swaziland, for example, that moved to South Africa to work in the mines for, um, for most of the year, uh, the conditions are very, very bad. Injury rates are extremely high, risk of death is extremely high, depression rates are extremely high, these people are overworked and underpaid. Often their only recourse to any kind of holiday or enjoyment is to seek out prostitution. So this is why um, at migrant destinations in South Africa, HIV prevalence rates are around 50%, which is enormous. The reason for high transmission rates among women are different, he argues, but come down to the same root cause, lack of decent jobs. One of the main drivers of HIV transmission among women is the pressures they face for transactional sex. Women who do not have access to formal employment or a steady income often have to seek their incomes from male friends or acquaintances that they have uh, through transactional sex. In extreme cases, women will turn to prostitution in order to secure incomes. This is very interesting because we, we know uh, from recent research that when women have access to formal employment, they are significantly less likely to pursue prostitution. There definitely is a lot of progress in, in mitigating the disease and stemming the spread of the disease. But for me, the big question is why has it persisted for this long? It's been more than 30 years since, we, since the first case of AIDS was diagnosed in Swaziland. Ickel argues that the real causes of HIV transmission are being ignored. One of the crucial factors is uh, the increasing rate of unemployment, okay? So it's very difficult to find formal employment in, in Swaziland. And this is actually, I would like to say, one of the main drivers of HIV transmission in the country. During the 1980s and 1990s, Swaziland was subject to what we call uh, structural adjustment programs. So these are, these are economic policy packages that are imposed on third world countries by international financial institutions such as the 
IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. What these uh, structural adjustment programs do is they force the government to, uh, to cut spending on social services, such as healthcare and education. They force the government to, um, to gear the majority of its, uh, of its financial resources towards debt repayment to rich countries. They also force the country to adopt monetary policy measures, such as targeting low inflation, that actually makes it very difficult for them to stimulate local employment. The blame lies with international financial institutions, such as the IMF and the World Bank, that have imposed these economic policies. But if outsiders are mostly to blame, it's not without the help of local elites. The king is said to have a personal fortune of $200 million. He costs 18% of the national budget. He's been widely criticised for his lavish lifestyle. So the king is extremely rich. Many of his closest family members and advisors and politicians are also extremely rich. Uh, and the vast majority of the population is extremely poor. The King of Swaziland has benefited tremendously, personally, from structural adjustment programs because it's allowed the, the rapid development of, say, for example, sugar cane plantations, which the King owns in large part. So the King benefits tremendously um, from some of these trade agreements, uh, even though um, these agreements hurt uh, the average Swazi in many cases. So, so because Swaziland is not a real democracy, it's very difficult for people who are affected by these kinds of policies to argue against them. If they're in the king's interest, then the king will support them, even if they're not in the interests of much of the population. Yes, money has been spent on awareness campaigns, but against a background of a general steep decline on healthcare spending. And of course, there's the issue of ARVs, drugs that delay the onset of AIDS-related illnesses. When antiretroviral med medications, ARVs, were first, uh, were first produced, they cost around $15,000 for an individual for one year. Now this is an inordinate amount of, <laughs> amount of money that it essentially makes these really important life-saving drugs totally out of reach for the vast majority of Swati citizens. Unfortunately, in 1995, when the World Trade Organization passed the, uh, the TRIPS agreement, the Trade Related Intellectual Property Rights Agreement, what this did is it, it banned, it illegalized the production of generic antiretroviral drugs. For all of the late 1990s and the early 2000s, even though it was possible to get cheap ARVs, uh, pharmaceutical companies kept the prices inordinately high. This basically kept treatment away from people that needed it most. In the 2000s, uh, there were exceptions made to the TRIPS agreement that allowed um, countries like Swaziland with, with, uh, with massive public health burdens to import generic medications. But the important thing here is that the vast majority of the disease burden in Swaziland today can be accounted for largely by the fact that these pharmaceutical companies kept, uh, kept drug prices unnecessarily high.